Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. Um, I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Conversation with Fernando Torres Gill and Ai Jen Poo. Um, I want to especially thank Sue Smalley for helping put today's program together and for being such a fantastic asset for the Hammer Museum. Um, for those of you who are new to the Hammer, I uh, just want to let you know that all of our exhibitions and public programs are always free. And if you want to be on a mailing list, you can get information about them by signing up for the email list in the lobby. And you can always check out our website as well. Also, many of our public programs are available on the Hammer website and on live stream as podcasts. And today's program will be live streamed, so you can share it with your friends and colleagues. So on to today's Hammer conversation. The concept of the conversation series is to bring together some of the most important thinkers of our time. Today's guest speakers are at the forefront of two incredibly important issues for all of us, aging with dignity and working with dignity. The population of people in the United States over 65 years or older is currently around 40 million, but in the next 15 years, that number is gonna rise to around 72 million people, more than double the number from the year 2000. So we all need to think about how we want to live as we get older and how to care for older people as well. Fernando Torres Gill and Ai Jen Poo both work directly on these questions. And today is a great opportunity to hear from them and about the growing movement to bring care of our elders back home, back to their own homes, where people generally tend to feel the most safe and secure and to create much needed jobs in the process. Fernando Torres Gill was born and raised in Salinas, California, the son of migrant farm workers. He studied political science at Hartnell Community College and San Jose State, and then continued on to obtain an MSW and a PhD in social policy, planning, and research from Brandeis University. Dr. Torres Gill's multifaceted career spans the academic, professional, and po policy arenas. He is a professor of social welfare and, and public policy at UCLA, an adjunct professor of gerontology at USC, and director of the UCLA Center for Policy Research on Aging. He served as Associate Dean and Acting Dean at the UCLA School of Public Affairs, and most recently Chair of the Social Welfare Department. He's written six books and over 100 publications, including The New Aging, Politics and Change in America. His academic contributions have earned him membership in the prestigious academies of public administration, gerontology, and social insurance. And his research spans important topics of health and long-term care, disability, entitlement reform, and the politics of aging. He's more than an academic, though. He has an impressive portfolio of public service and national and international recognition as a leading spokesperson on demographics, aging, and public policy. He earned his first presidential appointment when President Jimmy Carter appointed him to the Federal Council on Aging. He was then selected as White House Fellow to the Secretary for the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He was then the first ever U.S. Assistant Secretary on Aging in the Department of Health and Human Services. As the Clinton administration's chief advocate on aging, Torres Gill played a key role in promoting the importance of the issues of aging, long-term care and disability, community services for the elderly, and baby boomer preparation for retirement. He also managed the administration on aging and organized the 1995 White House Conference on Aging, in addition to serving as a member of the President's Welfare Reform Working Group. In 2010, he received his third presidential appointment when President Obama appointed him vice chair of the National Council on Disabilities. He continues to provide leadership in philanthropy and nonprofit organizations as a board member of the AARP, and he's a former board member of the California Endowment, the National Steinbeck Center in Salinas, and the Los Angeles Chinatown Service Center. Ai Jin Poo was born and raised in California and Connecticut by Taiwanese immigrant, immigrant parents. She earned her BA at Columbia University and then began organizing immigrant women workers in 1996 at the, work, sorry, at the Women Workers Project in New York City. In 2000, she co-founded the Domestic Workers United, a citywide multiracial organization of domestic workers, where she spent countless hours in parks, buses, and other gathering places for domestic workers, creating opportunities for these women to share their experiences and guiding mistreated workers to appropriate legal channels, as well as articulating the vital economic role of domestic workers and developing a framework of legal standards for the industry. In 2010, New York State enacted the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which entitles workers to overtime pay, one day of rest per week, protection from 
discrimination, and three days paid leave per year after a hard-fought seven-year campaign led by Ai Jin Poo and a dedicated group of workers and advocates. She joined the National Domestics Work Domestic Workers Alliance as executive director in 2010, and in 2011, Aijin helped launch Caring Across Generations, a movement to build caring, a caring majority committed to creating the systems and supports that allow us to mature with dignity, security, and independence. Aijin serves on the board of directors of Moms Rising, National Jobs with Justice, Working America, and the National Council on Aging. Aijin is a 2014 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, and was named to Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2010. Among her other early accolades are the Open Society Institute Community Fellowship, the Ford Foundation Leadership for a Changing World Award, the Ernest DeMaio Award from Labor Research Association, and the Women of Vision Award from the Ms. Foundation for Women. And now, without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ai Jen Poo and Fernando Torres Gill. Good, good afternoon. Thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, thank you for, uh, Claudia, for the uh, presentation. Thank you for the introductions. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for uh, being with us on a beautiful Sunday afternoon when most Angelinos are usually at the beach or the park or at a sports event, but I believe you are here because uh, you recognize or at least feel that this is a topic that will matter to you, to your families, to your neighbors, and to your friends. So it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor for me to be with Ms. Ai Jin Poo, who is really, in my opinion, the uh, reason why you should be here. And you will certainly be hearing about her uh, both superb and timely narratives as well as a compelling reason why we must all begin to think about the caregiving issues which will probably define for many of us how we live our lives and how we enjoy, hopefully, increased longevity. So I will start by setting the stage and saying a few comments and uh, I will be wearing my academic hat, which means I won't be anywhere half as interesting as Ms. Ai Jin Poo. So please bear with me. Uh, these are topics that at UCLA I spend entire quarters teaching students, but let me summarize why this is becoming a major issue. As was mentioned earlier, very simply, we are living longer, longer than ever before. And uh, that is a great accomplishment. We should all be thrilled about that. At the same time, it means that uh, while we enjoy increased longevity, there will be many more of us that will reach that exalted stage known as senior citizenhood or being an older adult or being a member of AARP. But it also means that there will be more of us as we enjoy that longevity that will need assistance, that will need to find ways to both take care of ourselves and eventually to be taken care of. And one of the great mysteries about this unprecedented longevity is what happens at that latter stage in life, whether you're 70 years old, 80, 90, even 100 years of age. What happens when we begin to experience chronic conditions, frailty, mobility limitations, or the vicissitudes of aging? And then it poses a question that few of us think about until it happens. And then it might be a little late. And that question is very simply, who will take care of us? Who will be there to assist us with what we academics call the activities of daily living? Who will be there to enable us to stay in our homes, to stay in our communities? And then the follow-up question, who are those caregivers? Who do we depend on? And those are the issues that we would like to address with you today and to bring it home 
in a more personal fashion. And we thank you for being here and giving us that opportunity to share in these very important issues. We want to allow time so that you can ask us questions or share a personal story. But now let me introduce Ms. Agent Poo. And let me just say, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Agent, it's wonderful to see a young person interested in these issues. You don't look an age a year over 25. <laughs> and uh, I'm an old guy. I am now 66 years of age. I've been in the field for 40 years. And I am both thrilled that we are now having the next generations mm -hmm. taking an interest in these important issues of gerontology and geriatrics. But more than that, I want to thank you for the incredible work you have done organizing home care workers, working with immigrant communities, bringing a new measure of respect and value to those of us, to those who are taking care of us, hmm. and to those that we need to do more for in order to give them the rewards and the credibility and the visibility that they deserve. Your work has taken us much further than any of us in my field. We thank you for all that mm. you're doing, for the book you will share with us. And I'd like to turn it over to you to say a few words. Thank you, Agent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just warning you, it's going to be a love fest up here <laughs> for the next hour. Um, Claudia failed to mention my most important identity in my bio, which is a very proud new mentee of Fernando here. Oh, thank you. I've learned so much from your writing and your thinking and all that you've done to pave the way for this to be a real national priority for the future and one that is fully inclusive of the full diversity of who we are as a country. So thank you for your leadership. And we both, in preparing for that, we had a great time preparing for this conversation, by the way, and um, are so thankful for you being here and want to involve you a lot throughout the course of the conversation. Um, and we wanted to begin by bringing it home, literally, for all of us. Um, and really grounding this conversation in personal story. There's a lot of data and demographic statistics and things that we can talk about, but at the end of the day, this is something that really does affect all of us across generations. And um, what I mean by that is, when we think about this issue of caregiving, it is, actually Rosalind Carter said it best. She said that there are only four kinds of people in the world. People who are caregivers or will be caregivers. People who need care or will need care. And the truth of it is, is that most of us are more than one of those identities at any given moment in time. Um, and just to prove that she's right, I'm going to ask you to bear with us for a second and actually turn to the person sitting next to you. And if you're not sitting next to somebody, maybe try to come closer. And for the next couple of minutes, share a story of someone who's taking care of you in your life and the value of that relationship. Um, and I ask people to do this all the time, and you will survive it, I promise. <laughs> um, but basically, just share a story, somebody who's taken care of you and the value of that relationship in your life. And we'll just take a couple of minutes to do it, maybe one minute each way, and I'll let you know when the time is up to switch. Okay? Thank you. This is your, uh, while you're doing this, note, this is your therapeutic moment. <laughs> so each of us probably has multiple care stories, and we wanted to begin with that because so often when it comes to the moment to really think about or talk about caregiving, sometimes we're in a moment of crisis. Um, but in reality, when we take a step back and look at the caregiving relationship, there's actually inside of all of the complexity of it, and uh, we will both admit that it is incredibly complex. Um, there is also a tremendous amount of joy and beauty within that relationship, and we have found um, the power of story to be absolutely transformative and really helping us 
um, be able to uncover the joys and the beauty of caregiving. And with that, uh, we want to queue up a film, um, a short, uh, not a film, <laughs> a little short video of a woman named Bev, who is a retired public school teacher in New York City, and who is um, a storyteller who works with the campaign Caring Across Generations that I co-direct. And uh, we have a partnership with The Moth. Have you heard of The Moth, the storytelling group? Um, and so they are working with us and our many, many powerful everyday caregiver storytellers. Um, and Bev is one of them. And we just thought Bev's story was a perfect way to kick off this afternoon's conversation about both the complexities of our relationship to the need for care and the joy of it. So take it away, Bev. I've always lived my life <clears throat> as a very independent person, doing things for myself, by myself. And I think this goes back to when I was eight years old. My mom used to walk me to school every day. It was about five blocks from my home. But then she had my brother, and things changed. And I said, wow, this is my opportunity for independence. And I pleaded with my parents, to let me go to school by myself. Well, we had a discussion, and I was a pretty responsible kid, so they felt that I could probably do it. What I didn't know was the first week that I went on my own, my father was behind me, <laughs> making sure that I was doing the right thing and that I was safe. He must have been satisfied because I was allowed to go to school on my own for the rest of the year and for the rest of the time I was in elementary school. So it's not surprising when later in life I needed total hip replacements on both the right and left hip. I took myself to the hospital both times. I never thought of doing it a different way. And then as I got older and my mobility became a little more challenged, I went from a cane to a rollator. A rollator is just a fancy name for a walker. It has four wheels for more stability. It has um, hand brakes. It has a seat to sit on in case I got tired. And it has a basket underneath to hold things in. This walker became my constant companion. So I felt I really needed a name for it. And so it became Alice Walker. <laughs> And, 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 and Alice, Alice and I used to walk up and down Broadway on the Upper West Side of New York. We would do what we wanted to do. We would go where we wanted to go. We were totally independent, and I was loving my life. But then, on September 20th, 2014, things changed. I went to the podiatrist, someone I go to every five weeks because I got terrible feet. And usually when I leave him, I'm feeling a lot better because he takes care of all corns and calluses, cuts my nails, he does all these things. But this time when I left his office, I was still in pain. I noticed that my left foot was dragging. And as much as I tried to walk faster, I was in snail mode. So I realized something was wrong. I took myself to the urgent care center near my home. And after examining me, the doctor said, you have to go to the ER at New York Presbyterian Hospital for an MRI. And the MRI confirmed that I had had a stroke. So I was admitted to the stroke unit at the hospital. And I was there for the next five days. It wasn't long before I encountered two of the most dreaded symbols of total dependence, the call button and the bedpan. The first time I rang the call button when I needed, nature was calling. It took so long for someone to respond that I figured they were coming from a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> and when the bedpan came, I said, whoever designed this knew nothing about human anatomy. And if there's anything worse than waiting for a bedpan, it's waiting 
and waiting and waiting for someone to take it away. At the end of the five days, I still couldn't walk. So the social worker suggested that I go to Amsterdam House, which is a rehab place, right across from St. John the Divine Cathedral. It couldn't have been a better choice. I got occupational therapy and physical therapy on a daily basis, and most of the times even on the weekends. I got all the help I needed, but I was always encouraged at every step to try to do as much as I could for myself. So I went from a wheelchair to Alice, and my first big breakthrough was when Alice and I went to the bathroom by ourselves. Can you imagine, at the age of 80, I actually was able to go to the bathroom by myself. What an accomplishment. From there, we walked unaccompanied to the dining room back and forth three times each day. But the big triumph was when I got on the elevator on the 11th floor, went down to the first floor, and took myself over to the snack machine, where I satisfied my craving for potato chips and cookies. And Alice and I became very good friends with that snack machine <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. At the beginning of January, it was decided that I was well enough to continue my recovery at home. I would be getting OT and PT on an outpatient basis, and I was ready. When I got off the elevator in my home, the first thing I saw was an arc of balloons around my door welcoming me home. Can you imagine how that made me feel? That was just the beginning. When I opened the door, this 40-year-old carpet that was disintegrating before my eyes was gone. The floor was absolutely clean. Furniture that had been in the way and would have made it impossible for me to move around the apartment easily was gone. My refrigerator was restocked. The new mattress I had ordered was set up and ready for me to lay down as soon as I was tired. And in general, I looked around the apartment. I said, wow, is this where I'm living? And every day in the two weeks that I've been home, someone has come in to continue to make improvements to my apartment. My guardian angel, Jennifer, comes in every day. And so far, the two of us have filled up three huge garbage bags with stuff, things I didn't even know I had, things I know I had and I didn't want. But, and anyone now who walks into my apartment says, wow, it looks so much bigger. It's not. It's a small studio, but it is not as cluttered as it was before. So I started to think about my journey over the past three months. And I said, you know what? Getting help is really not that bad. Independence is a state of mind. And Instead of diminishing me, it empowers me to return to the life I led, BTS, before the stroke. So I now think of myself as a very independent person with benefits. <laughs> So, Fernando, you also have quite a story in terms of what brought you to this work of really trying to understand and help the country move forward in terms of preparing for aging and our caregiving needs. Could you share a little bit about your story? Most, most happy to. And first of all, uh, just so pleased that you were all comfortable, willing to share a little bit of yourself to each other. Consider this a first step towards interdependence and your inevitable long-term care period in your life. And uh, in, my re in, in my own story, I Jen, uh, reflecting what this wonderful lady had to say, uh, I had a huge advantage over everyone, a huge advantage over all of you. And that is I've been uh, practicing for long-term care and caregiving my entire life. Hmm. 
because I contracted polio when I was six months of age. Mm. And from six months of age till I was 16, I was uh, institutionalized in uh, Shriners Hospital mm. in San Francisco. So I had to, at a very young age, immediately accept and get used to others helping me, asking for help, and learning how to accept it gracefully. Mm and learning how to enjoy it, and I dare say, take advantage of it. <laughs> and, uh, but that taught me some important lessons. And when I would go home, my mother, who was a single mother raising nine children, and I was disabled and needed constant rehabilitation, had my grandmother move in, mm. she became my uh, grandera, my uh, brujeria, my physical therapist, mm -hmm. my masseuse, and she did everything to give me a measure of independence, but also to show me, to teach me. It's okay to accept that you can't do everything, and it's okay to ask others for help, mm -hmm. but it is important to give back as well in whatever way that you can. And so I have always learned those lessons from my mother, my mom, my aunts, my sisters, the village that has enabled me to grow and have a wonderful life and all that I have done. And so that's why I say my advantage over everyone else is uh, I started early to uh, learn how to be interdependent, and it's been such an advantage as I move into that later stage in life. But tell us, Aijin, how did you, as mm -hmm. a young person that clearly had the talents, the ability to be a doctor, an engineer, to do other great things in your life. How did you get interested in something that the public doesn't seem to give much value to? Hmm. Long-term care, the needs of domestic home workers, organizing those who take care of us. Tell us your story and how you came to do something hmm. that ultimately is noble and needs more recognition. Well, uh, like you, I had a, the great privilege of um, having my grandparents play a really heavy role in raising me. Um, both grandparents on both sides of the family were a really big part of um, my upbringing from six months on. And um, both my grandparents lived with me. Both sets of grandparents lived with me at different times during my childhood. And I also went to live with them in Taiwan. And um, both of my grandparents taught me really important things, uh, very different things. My grandmother taught me um, every, well, she potty trained me, which was very useful. <laughs> um, but she taught me how to cook. She taught me about the importance of laughter. She taught me about the value of um, learning from your elders and listening. Um, and my grandfather, who was a Tai Chi master, actually taught me Tai Chi. Um, he taught me everything from the secrets of the television show Wheel of Fortune, which was his favorite show, to hard work and discipline and the value of really kind of practice, um, which was something we did. We practiced Tai Chi, we practiced piano, and we practiced lots of different things together. So the value of practice. And I think that um, one of the things that also that they actually had very similar um, histories of surviving wars and migration and working hard, raising families, many generations of families. But both my grandfather on my father's side and my grandmother on my mother's side had very different experiences when it came to long-term care. And um, my grandfather, unfortunately ended up spending the last three months of his life in a nursing home, um, where much against his wishes. He wanted to stay at home, but um, we had to place him in a nursing home, and he passed away alone and afraid and um, uh, staying in a very dehumanizing condition. And um, on the other hand, my grandmother, who's still here with us, actually, she lives in Alhambra, just down the street. And we just celebrated, or we will be celebrating her 89th birthday. And she still lives independently in her own apartment, goes to church twice a week, plays mahjong. She's very, very active in the community. She sings in the senior church choir. 
and she's still living life on her own terms at 89 because she's supported by a home care worker named Mrs. Sun, who has become sort of an extension of our family, and her family has also become an extension of ours. And Mrs. Sun allows for my grandmother to live independently and live life on her terms after caring for so many of us. Um, but the, f the difference there was in some ways accidental. Our family didn't have a plan for long-term care. Um, and, uh, and so my grandfather ended up in one scenario, my grandmother ended up in another. And one of the things that I realized quickly was that not very many families do have a plan when it comes to caregiving, and that we as a country, in fact, don't have a plan. Um, and that is actually something I experienced through my work life, where I have been working with domestic workers alongside the women who care for the most precious elements of our lives, our children, our homes, our aging loved ones, and really working hard over the last two decades to secure basic rights and protections for this workforce. They take care of the most precious elements of our lives, but are still among the most undervalued and most vulnerable workers in our economy today, most of whom work for poverty wages and struggle for basic things like paid time off or um, the opportunity to go to a PTA meeting for their own children. Um, and so um, watching that happen, where this workforce that is doing such precious work is so undervalued and has to really struggle just to care for their own families. And meanwhile, we have this huge and growing need for caregiving in every American household to the point where by the year 2050, 27 million Americans will need some form of long-term care or assistance just to meet their basic daily needs. And so we've got this really unstable, vulnerable, and invisible workforce on the one hand that's struggling for basic dignity, and we've got this um, complete lack of a plan for how we're gonna support 27 million of our loved ones to get the care that they need. And somewhere inside of that, I realized that there is a win-win solution in there, that we could potentially transform these caregiving jobs the fastest growing occupation in the country because of the huge need into good jobs for the 21st century that you can take pride in and support your family on. Um, and meanwhile, support the loved ones of all, all of our loved ones to be able to live with dignity and choice in our homes, in our communities, connected and very much a part of our um, culture and our society in an integrated way. And so we, in starting in 2011, started working on developing win-win solutions to strengthen the caregiving workforce, to bring domestic workers and caregivers out of the shadows, to train them, to elevate wages, make these jobs good jobs, and to figure out how we make home care and lots of care choices much more accessible and affordable for every single family in America, and how we create a public policy framework that supports all of that for the future. So it was kind of like a personal experience met everything that I saw working with these women as they went to work every day, struggling to assert their basic dignity. Mm -hmm. And my question to you, Fernando, after doing this work on aging issues for so long, is what do you see now that the boomers are reaching retirement age at a rate of 10,000 people per day, 4 million people per year, um, and people are living longer than ever, as you mentioned, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities today in making caregiving a national priority for the future? Well, first, let me thank you for the incredible work you've done with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And uh, she received, as was mentioned earlier, what's called a MacArthur Genius Award. But it's recognition for pushing in society an issue that is often overlooked. And we thank you for what you're doing on behalf of all home care workers. Thank you. Thank you. An award richly deserved. and. I say that because my work in this area has been 
in the public policy arena, I think you've heard of the different political appointments, my work on the Hill in the Congress, my work in government, my work in the Department of Health and Human Services, and my work in public policy. I have to make an admission to you, Aijin. I have failed. Oh, no. We have failed. And uh, I want to answer uh, your question you posed to me by first saying that at this point in time, the issues of home care workers, <coughs> caregiving, long-term care is not on the national agenda. It is not considered a priority concern by Republicans, by Democrats, by independents. Yet. And sadly, not yet, but sadly, we have two examples of how we have not succeeded. The first in the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Mm. We, the disability advocates, the senior citizen groups working closely with Senator Kennedy's office, succeeded in putting into the Affordable Care Act for the first time ever a public long-term care insurance program called CLASS, which finally had the federal government directly involved in trying to make long-term care insurance more affordable. Within three years, it went into deep hibernation because Democrats and Republicans felt it would be too costly and that it would be one more entitlement program that this country cannot afford. We no longer have the Class Act. And most recently, the Department of Labor passed the regulation, which for the first time would give home care workers, domestic workers, long-term care workers, such basic rights as a minimum wage payment for overtime. A judge recently rescinded that directive. So we have taken a few steps forward and many steps backward. So that is why I say that, say that those of us that have worked at the policy advocacy front have not succeeded and we need another way to educate and socialize the public, to tell the story. And that is why I'm so thrilled that you are here with the book that I want you to talk about. But let me just add to this. With 78 million baby boomers now 50 years of age and over, all those of us born between 1946 and 1964, you may not want to accept this reality, but we are all 50 years of age and over. By 2029, and first let me ask, how many of us fit in that cohort? How many of us are in the baby boomer cohort? You want me to make you more depressed? By 2029, each of us will be 65 years of age and over. All 78 million of us will be 65 years of age and over by 2029. And starting that period in our lives when we are most likely to need caregiving and will need long-term care support. We have nothing available to us unless you qualify for Medicaid or Medi-Cal, and that's not the program you want to be on. Medicare doesn't cover it. Old Americans Act provides some supportive services. And other than that, you either better have private long-term care insurance, expensive, many restrictions, or as we like to say, you better have lots of daughters or you better make lots of good friends as Alice did here. So we are facing this huge unresolved crisis and that gets to the question, who is available now to take care of us, to be the home care workers? Who does this work? We've got a really um, a, a direct care workforce of about three million, mostly women, and mostly women of color who do direct care work. Um, about a third of all direct care workers are immigrant, um, and many are African American. Um, so it's a very diverse workforce, and unfortunately, um, has been really, truly undervalued. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of work we need to do to professionalize this workforce, bring the workforce out of the shadows, offer training and certification and real supports. And I, the thing that I can often compare this to is 
because of the demand, home care is actually the fastest growing occupation in the nation. So these are, whether we like it or not, the jobs of the future. Um, and the question is, how do what kind of jobs will they be, and how do we make them jobs that you can take pride in? And the analog for me is in the 1920s and 30s, manufacturing jobs were a major part of the base of this economy. And they were sweatshop jobs, oftentimes done by immigrants, um, working in very dangerous conditions. <coughs> and we managed to transform sweatshop jobs into good jobs that provided the economic foundation for this country, um, where each generation could do better than the next and actually get into pathways of professionalization and real economic opportunity. And if, if we are able to get ourselves onto a track of investing in caregiving, there is a tremendous opportunity there to transform what has historically been an un undervalued low-wage work into good jobs, while also supporting all the American families, particularly those in the sandwich generation, who are really squeezed between the pressures of caring for children and caring for aging loved ones to actually be able to have the support that they need to go into the workforce and to really move towards their full potential within the workforce. And it also, of course, allows for more choice for our aging loved ones in terms of how they want to age, live as they age. And I really do think that this is a, an, it's a moment of opportunity. We have always undervalued caregiving. We have always undervalued and, under, and, and not accounted for the work that goes into caring for families. And it has always been an unsustainable situation, overly burdened um, in terms of women. And this is an opportunity, particularly given the need, to really turn the country's attention towards that and establishing a new approach to caregiving for the 21st century that allows for us to realistically embrace who we are, who we're becoming as a country, and prepare, have a plan, put the infrastructure in place, make the jobs good jobs, and support people to live well as they age or at every stage of life. And I do believe that aging is a, it's not a depressing thing. It's a, um, I think that it's a, living longer is the opportunity to learn longer, to teach longer, to work longer, to love longer. And it's just a question of how do we support one another to do so um, with maximum choice and support and knowing that we're not in this alone. Let me just add another bit of demographics that reinforces your point. Uh, I like to uh, throw out provocative questions earlier is who will take care of us. My other provocative rhetorical question, who's having the babies? Or restated, who is not having the babies? Which helps to explain why the future workforce of long-term care home care workers is going to be heavily immigrant That's minority right. and ethnics because non-Hispanic whites or whites have fallen below replacement level. They're below the 2.1 necessary for a population's death to equal the number of births. So if we left it to our Caucasian white females in this audience, <laughs> you're not having the babies. You're about 1.8 and dropping. But yet there's a net increase in the population. So somebody's having the babies. How many of you are Hispanic and Asians here, females? Raise your hands, please, Hispanic and Asians. Would the rest of us give them a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's who's having the children. And their replacement rates is well above 2.1. So. We're fortunate in Southern California that we're more likely to find immigrant women and minority ethnic women that are both willing to work for low wages, no benefits, no recognition of the value of their work, and still consider it to be noble work, to care for others and to care for elders. And that's because of our large immigrant ethnic minority community. But in the future, that's who we will depend on. And thus, the work that you are doing is so important as we become 
a majority minority society. And uh, oftentimes in long-term care facilities, it never fails. You go there, it's a low-wage aid, LVN, ethnic minority immigrant female taking care of an older white retiree female. And often as not, that older white elderly woman was raised in a neighborhood or in an environment where she never had a chance to interact with the people that are now providing her intimate care. It's the irony of long-term care, more reason why what you're doing is so important. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about is really how do we get there? How do we get mm -hmm. from a place of where the average wages are between eight and nine dollars per hour, mm -hmm. right? And most people don't have adequate training or support. Um, it, how do we get from that place to a place where we have a strong and robust workforce for the future? And oftentimes, I mean, we have been working to bring home care workers under basic minimum wage and overtime protections for over 20 years. I mean, the exclusions in the labor law have existed for more than 75 years now. And we've been working for since the Clinton administration to reverse that made a big breakthrough and then we're, we're now stalled in the courts in terms of actually bringing those workers into under protections. And oftentimes what happens is people say, well, we can't afford to pay uh, workers more, right? And the interests of consumers and families get pitted against the interests of the workforce. And the truth is, is that we're all bearing a tremendous cost by the lack of a care infrastructure by the lack of subsidies and social programs um, and, and other kinds of supports for families and for the workers in terms of caregiving. And programs like the Class Act, right, the, the, the notion that it's too costly are oftentimes what gets in the way. And my question for you is, what is the cost of not investing in our caregiving infrastructure for the future. We now have studies that document that there's a huge cost for industry and employers and businesses. The cost associated with lost, with absenteeism, decline in productivity, and the stress that goes with having to balance out your children, caregiving for disabled or older persons, and trying to keep a job and trying to work. There's a big cost for women in lost opportunities, because often as not, it'll be the daughter, the sister, the mother-in-law who will have to take time off from their careers or take time off from a job that will pay into Social Security. So there's those lost opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's a cost in the moral degradation of witnessing a decline in the quality of life for those who have given throughout their lives and are now left to struggle to find someone to care for them. And there's a cost in the shadow industry of workers who feel that this is the only way they can move up the economic ladder and the American dream. And certainly there's a huge cost for caregivers and we always know that the person most likely to burn out in caregiving first is the caregiver, the emotional, the financial, the physical, the mental health responsibilities that go with that. So there are many costs that we are not accounting for and to give these basic protections and benefits would be a small investment mm -hmm. in an otherwise huge and necessary need. I would also add that there's tremendous opportunity on the table when it comes, when we think about what what could come of investing in the caregiving workforce as a big part of the solution for the future. When we think about who's really on the front lines monitoring whether medication is being taken or whether doctor's orders are being followed, um, who's preparing meals in terms of um, making sure that heart disease and other chronic illnesses are being monitored properly, um, who's actually making the call about whether something is a real cause 
pause for an er emergency room visit or not. If we invest in the caregivers, whether they're family caregivers or paid caregivers, on the front lines of the day-to-day -day lives of our loved ones, we can actually create lots of efficiencies and connectivity in, within our healthcare delivery system, which many have said is the way of the future, right? Connected communication across families and healthcare providers and the caregivers, home care workers, can be a huge part of the solution and the connection there. Um, and I think that that's just one way in which we actually ultimately save the system a tremendous amount of money by really investing in the po human potential and the skills and the talent already being performed um, in, the, in the caregiving workforce. And I think as we get now to the point where we're going to let you ask questions, let me pose my third rhetorical question. I've already <laughs> posed the first two. And we're talking now about this important industry, 21st century jobs, which can be a huge benefit for the economy, for opportunities. But how many of us here, let's just assume you have children, whether or not you do, let's just assume for the moment. <laughs> we all want our children to do well and go to UCLA or maybe to USC. They can't get into UCLA, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but we all want our children to do well and to get good careers and to feel rewarded and to make our families proud because they become engineers or physicians or administrators. But how many of us raise our children to be long-term care workers? I'm asking. How many of us are raising our children to be a long-term care worker? How do we do that? Why would we do that? That's a very good question. But I want to get back to that. But this is a question we've not asked ourselves and talked about in terms of what do we expect, not just for ourselves, but for those young people and others who are looking to the future. And I think therein lies one of the great challenges. But uh, I would just end by saying I'm hoping that we will develop coalitions to help us with the work you're doing, Agent, and with the policy advocacy we're st that we're still striving for. And there are greater co new constituencies that have a stake in this, certainly older adults and those of us that will be older, persons with disability of all ages, but increasingly our veterans, our wounded warriors who are returning from the wars, their lives are saved by new and wonderful medical technology, yet at the age of 18, 19, 21, 22, with multiple amputations or head trauma or paraplegics, they are now going to live 30, 40, 50 years in need of caregiving and home care. So if there was a way to bring us all together, that would be a powerful force. So. I really, and all of us at Caring Across Generations, really believe that this issue of caregiving is where really broad cross-sections of the American public and the electorate, all of our interests come together. It's about creating good jobs for the future. It's about creating choices for our aging loved ones to define how they want to age, live as they age. It's about supporting working adults who need family care supports as they go to work every day. It's about more choices, better quality care, better quality jobs for the future. There's so many win-wins here, and together, we actually have the political power and ca capacity to make this a national priority. Um, and I, one of the things that we've found so interesting is we've been going out and talking to seniors every election cycle about what they care about. And of course, retirement security is top of mind. And when you talk about aging in place and home care, and you actually talk about um, home care as an entry point for issues related to immigration and wages, you'll find that 
even among very conservative older voters, there's actual support, high levels of support for immigration reform, for higher wages, when you talk about the ways in which our interests come together to improve and strengthen the caregiving infrastructure in this country so that people have real choices as we age. So this is a place where as we're changing, as we become a so-called minority, majority minority nation going forward, and as we live longer, we need to find agenda items and frameworks that really knit our interests together so that we can actually see and practice our interdependence as a very diverse country. Um, my friend at Demos calls the American democracy the most ambitious experiment in democracy in the world. And something like caregiving, something as universally experienced as we all experienced when we shared our stories, as caregiving can be a place where we actually come together and build the America we want for the future. And that is a lot of what this book is about. Um, and uh, we, I hope that you'll um, continue to help us try to make caregiving a national priority for the future of this country. Um, and one of the things that we're doing with this book is going on a tour called Caring Across America. And we're asking people that we meet along the way, like all of you, to take this conversation home in a really authentic way with two simple questions. One is, how do we as a family prepare for our future caregiving needs? And the second question being, what do we imagine will be the joys of caring for one another as we age in the future? And by actually having the entry point be one of possibility and planning, as well as one that uncovers the potential joys of what it means to really take care of each other across generations. We hope that that'll create a new entry point for a, a long overdue conversation about the future and that we will take this conversation straight into the 2015 White House Conference on Aging, which only happens once every 10 years. So we want to hear from you about your thoughts and your ideas, and we're going to take them straight to the Capitol and elevate them and try to make this truly the national priority for the future that we all know it needs to be. And if we are, when we are successful, we believe it will unlock so much potential for positive social change all around us. And thank you for your leadership. And uh, let's now open it up to all of you, uh, questions and comments. And I'll try to, with the light, see who's Let's see, this person here, and speak uh, uh, as loud as you can, given the large uh, audience here. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, great, there's a microphone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of you. I know you said earlier that it would be a love fest, but thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it tremendously. And We're new best friends. <laughs> um, I'm a first year law student here at UCLA and um, a lot of the work that Domestic Workers United did and is doing really inspired me to um, take a certain path that led me to law school. Um, but part of what I've been struck by and often frustrated by is the adversarial system of the law um, and wondering how as um, a law student and hopefully a future attorney, um, I and others can provide support for domestic workers and those who are advocating with domestic workers other than as politicians. Great. Um, well, fortunately, you're in a state where we're going to be actually ramping up to renew a domestic workers bill of rights uh, in the state of California. Um, we passed the California domestic worker legislation two years ago. And, uh, and in 2016, that legislation will be sunsetting. So we have both the challenge and the opportunity to pass a new bill um, and to strengthen what's there in terms of protections and supports for the workforce. So we'll need you and everyone, all of your friends in law school, to help us in terms of the advocacy and the outreach and the education and the existing protections that were won two years ago, those need to be enforced. So we need to get the word out 
And oftentimes it's through word of mouth and people just telling people and for the culture change to happen, it really does need to happen from the bottom up where we're really talking to one another in our communities and organizing. It's an organizing um, challenge to really get the word out in an industry that's so dispersed and disaggregated. So education, outreach, and California, our next victory in 2016. We'll need your help. Great, great question. I see somebody over here. We have the light in front of us, so it's hard um, to see. Yes. I have a two-pronged uh, issue, both of them technological. So I'll bring up the future technology first, and I'll bring up the already existing technology. And we could keep our questions concise, please. Um, I won't be able to. <laughs> um, ro the first is robotics. Um, uh, the, the robotics that are already existing, for example, vacuum cleaners, mm -hmm. are easy. But fine motor skills, such as uh, changing somebody's socks and shoes, or bathing them, or those kind of things, are a ways off, and I'd like you to talk about how close we are to uh, robots being able to accomplish those tasks. The second is uh, already existing technology of cell phones. So we see caretakers that are out in the open. We don't see what goes on behind closed doors, but nannies are very similar, and they're outside to people, to the ladies who are taking care of people inside. Uh, nannies are no longer paying attention to the children and their care when they walk them down the street. They're on their cell phones. And you see children running ahead um, into driveways with cars that are pulling out. You see all, and, and the ladies on the phone. The, the, the domestic worker is a human being with the same interests. She may be earning a lower wage, but she has the same interests in her life as anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she wants to date. She wants to update her Facebook site with, um, uh, with new pictures of her own children. And behind closed doors, the lady addressed this in your short film clip of even when they're being watched, um, she says, like, how long is it going to take you to pick up my bedpan? Well, now that um, you can control, I take the bus maybe 10% of the time, and I see that everybody has um, up-to-date um, phone equipment and stuff. So na the caretakers behind closed doors are now, um, they are now playing games on their phones. They are now um, updating their own Facebook sites. They're taking care of their own, they're calling their own children to see if their kids are okay, because years ago they used to be isolated from their own kids during the day. They're not any longer. And they can also come with preloaded stuff in their phone that can hook up to the, t to the TV and allow them to watch their own programs all day. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to say something about technology? Yeah, if, if, say a few words. Well, I can. Uh, well, actually, you've raised a very important issue. Technology can be a tremendous uh, value added in terms of caregiving. In Japan, they're already developing the technology for robots to assist us with some of the activities of daily living. Uh, for someone like myself with a disability that may not be able to drive too many more years, I'm anxiously awaiting the Google driverless car, uh, and so there is great technology that can assist us with caregiving, and so hopefully that'll come online, whatever it's going to be, sooner than later. Thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? I think this person here, and then we'll go back there with the remaining time. Thank you. I was shocked to hear you say that only every 10 years mm -hmm. at the White House, we have this conference on aging. How can we change that to an annual event? Ooh. <laughs> That's a great question. We need to bring that up. <laughs> I think that can be one of the goals of this year's conversation is to actually call for a more frequent gathering on this issue. That's great. The White House conferences, conferences on aging began in 1950, then in 1961, and every 10 years. I think you're right. We need them 
more often. To President Obama's great credit, and this is not to be partisan, he called for this White House Conference on Aging. One of the four priority areas that will be discussed is caregiving. Mm -hmm. So it's a good start, and we thank the President. And they're doing regional conferences yeah. leading up to the national one. So there's going to be one this month in Tampa. There's going to be one in Phoenix, Boston, Seattle. Um, so they are trying to really hear from people around the country as well. And we need to keep encouraging that. And I love the suggestion of doing it annually. Thank you. Next common question up there. And I think we have one more over here we'll have time for. Hi. Um, my mother lived to be almost 98, and um, my sister and I are both therapists and uh, thought a lot about her living situation as she was journeying through her 90s. And it seems to me that there's a certain, and I feel it too, idealization in a way about people staying in their own homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a one on one caregiver, you know, however often, 24 7 or a couple times a week, whatever. But I'm wondering what either or both of you have thought about in terms of alternative housing as people get, um, well, of any age, it depends on the person. But I, my sister and I, began to see the value <coughs> of socialization. And uh, as my mother hit like 93, 94, she did, uh, you know, cooperatively decide to live in a more, um, you know, a residential kind of setting. But I think there's a lot to be said for that that doesn't get discussed too much. And I'm wondering what your thinking is about that. Well, very quickly, you've, you've raised a key point, and uh, those of us in concerned about these issues, have to be a little careful not to overemphasize or over-romanticize aging in place in your home. Most of us want to grow older in our home with the caregiving, the home care workers, the family members, friends, and chosen family. But there are alternatives that work better for individuals depending on their needs. We will always need nursing homes, mm -hmm. and we will need continuing care retirement communities, adult day health care centers, assisted living facilities, board and care facilities. We will need that full continuum. And as advocates, we need to avoid the nursing home bashing mm -hmm. as if it's all bad and evil, when in fact there are many variations of residential, communal, supports for different levels, skilled or intermediate or independent living, but we will need those alternatives. And ultimately, it's about choices and allowing individuals the choices and the availability of the options that best suits their needs and preferences. Aijin? That's right, and I would just lift up an inspiring model of the village movement. Thank Villages you. have been um, places where older people have been able to aggregate their resources and consumer power and um, create through economies of scale, um, reduced rates on transportation, um, sharing caregivers, um, sharing cost the cost of groceries. I mean, it's um, it's a a uh, chosen community, so to speak, um, and uh, also a really great model, and they're growing around the country. Um, and those kinds of solutions that people are building all over the country are precisely what needs to get encouraged and nurtured and seeded um, because they come out of people's authentic different needs. And that's what the future is about. As Fernando said, choices based off of your needs, and those really do vary. And the gentleman over here, I think there was the gentleman was next. And if the audience has patience, we'll take one, one more. Th and you've, you've all been great. Please, sir. Oh. Yes. Thank you, uh, Fernando, and thank oh. you, Aijin, for I, a, a wonderful, inspiring. I didn't recognize you there, Gary, with the lights. <laughs> I thought there was a halo around my yes. head. Man. So thank you for a compelling and inspiring conversation. And, and as I listened uh, to what you're talking about, it strikes me the one reason that we devalue caregiving is is our own fear of being yeah. cared for. Mm. That, that you know we're an independent society. We we value 
being independent, standing on your own feet. And to, and to take care from somebody else, it's almost something shameful. And I'm thinking of, you know, we all know about ageism. In a way, we all suffer from charism. I mean, hmm. our own fear of being <laughs> cared for. And I wonder if, a new if, term. So it's a, it's a huge, <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> you inspired me. <laughs> you know, it's a huge psychological issue that we all need help with. Great. I do. That's right, and I, there's a lot of different things that feed into that, our culture around kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and also just the notion that caregiving has historically been associated with women, been assumed that women will kind of take care of, and it'll be a natural role for women, and therefore really not accounted for, for its economic and very material value. Um, and so there's lots of factors for why charism exists, but if ever there was a moment to shift that, to transform that, it's now. And I do have to say one of the things that makes me feel very hopeful about this moment is the boomer generation really is such a culture-driving generation, just like millennials. Um, we call boomers and millennials the new power couple. Um, because um, they are actually really quite connected and there's many, many cultural similarities and parallels and um, millennials are more connected to their grandparents than any other generation. But I think if any ever there was going to be a generation to transform how we feel as a nation about aging and caregiving, it is boomers. And so... I'm very hopeful, and the fact that millennials are more connected to their grandparents than any generation in history, and every cultural kind of survey reflects back that millennials and young people actually really want to connect to older generations and sometimes don't know how, that this is really about a moment where it's like cultural acupuncture, like the, tr the, the trends are happening, we just have to find the right interventions to open up the possibilities for the future. Thank you. Last question, and uh, please. So I love the metaphor of the village here, and thank you, Sue and Claudia and all of you. So here in our village and with the Hammer and UCLA and Los Angeles, what are ways that we can continue this conversation and develop that amongst ourselves, and how does that connect to this? I mean, obviously, we can buy copies of the book, and we can talk about it individually. How does it connect to what you're doing online with your tour across the country, but, and how can we further this? Please. Go. So on the website, Karen, thank you, Laura. <laughs> on the website, caringacrossamerica.com, we're asking people to report out your, com your conversations that you're having at your family dinner table about this and get involved in the conversation building towards the White House Conference on Aging to really elevate these issues. And next year is a very important presidential election cycle where we have another opportunity to make caregiving and central conversation piece in the next big political moment in this country. There's lots of opportunities and through signing up on caringacrossamerica.com, we will keep you posted. And locally here in LA, there is something called the LA Care Council, where every month people actually come together and think about what can we do to make LA a more age-friendly city? Um, what can we do to support caregivers and domestic workers and home care workers here in LA? How do we bring these interests together? How do we support better training? Um, all these local, very local solutions um, are being developed at the LA Care Council, and that's another way to get involved, and we can give you more information on that after as well. Great. And I think uh, that's a good way to not end, but to begin and push this conversation. Ai Jin Poo, you are, you are doing amazing things for us, I don't want to say older people, but those of us <laughs> that have had our time we're turning the torch over to you. But in the last words of the movie Casablanca, you might be too young to remember that movie. But in the last words where Humphrey Bogart walks off with the inspector in the fog and says, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and partnership. And we want to thank you for pushing this movement along. And thank you all for being here with us. Let's continue this struggle. Thank Huge you very much. round of applause for Fernando. And the book signing for her book will be outside.
and for his book.